Greetings, my name is Neo Second, and welcome back to my Let's Play of Higurashi When They Cry Chapter 3. In the last episode, Keiji started making his preparations to kill Satoko's uncle, and at the end of the day, he gave me on a call asking her to uh, take Satoko to the Watanagashi Festival in his place, because in his vaguely defined words, he's got, so he's got something that he has to do, but he refused to uh, tell me on what, exactly what it is. And Mion seemed to notice uh, dis some disturbing parallels between Keiichi's words and the timing of his call and, his, and the exact nature of his request with uh, what Satoshi ended up apparently doing about a year ago, where he, sh where he ended up uh, making uh, the, the same exact request at the same exact time to Mion a year, a year ago before uh, he ended up disappearing. And that's basically made, uh, and that basically made Keiichi re realize and start wondering, just how is so how similar exactly Satoshi's actions were to his own in the present day. And if they're exactly similar, then he started uh, thinking, did Satoshi do the same thing he's about to do to Satoko's uncle, to uh, Satoko's aunt back a year ago? Basically, did Satoshi? actually kill his actually kill his uncle in order to uh, protect Satoko from her abuse. He was, he was speculating about this out loud with Mion, and both really weren't able to say for sure one way or the other. Although they both although Mion seemed to acknowledge the po the possibility that something like that could have happened, but again, there's no proof and the fact that they caught, supposedly caught the culprit back then some uh, some druggy deviant basically uh, made the case resolved in the eyes of the, of the police, but it still unsettled Keiichi a bit, but not enough to make him stop, make him seriously stop and reconsider what he's doing, though, unfortunately. And well, Mion then agreed to uh, take Satoko to the Watanaga Watanagashi Festival because that was something that she and the rest of the other club members were already planning to do anyway. Which, which uh, Keiichi would have known about if he had spent the day preparing the festival with them. But alas, he had business. And that was pretty much the end of the day. And we also uh, found a tip that uh, went into detail about the arrest of the uh, deviant in question that was supposedly guilty for killing Satoko's aunt. And he apparently died in, 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 in under mysterious circumstances in captivity. So, that definitely raises a few questions, like how the hell did that happen, but, well, I have no answers for that at this point. Although I think I did speculate at the end that, I, although I believe I speculated at the end that maybe there's some kind of cover-up involved, but, well, I couldn't really find an answer as to who would benefit from covering up uh, Satoshi's crime if he actually ended up killing uh, his aunt back then. So, yeah, that little theory of mine has got a few holes I got plug up first before anything else. Otherwise, if I can't, otherwise if it doesn't stand up to scrutiny with more information I uncover later on, I'm just gonna have to let that ship sink. Anyway, I think that covers everything. So uh, let's hit continue and witness murder, I guess, because I guess this is gonna happen no matter what. And it's the day of the Watanagashi Festival, so. Hold on to your butts. Sunday. The fireworks I heard before noon were probably to announce the opening of the festival. And the weather. Certainly wasn't festival weather. It was cloudy. The television forecast was calling for possible downpours starting this evening and lasting until around midnight. But as long as it wasn't raining at the moment, the festival would go on. The festival had to open, or it wouldn't begin. The Farood Shrine grounds were probably decorated beautifully for the big performance that only happened once a year. Many paper lanterns were all hung up, all in the auspic auspicious colors of red and white. The sound of electric motors at the stalls. 
the voices of kids running around, their happy families watching them, smiling. Today was the festival of Watanagashi. Was everyone already partaking in the festivities. Well, I imagine that Tomotake and Takano are busy, uh, are busy break, are going to be busy anyway, breaking into that uh, ritual, st that ritual storehouse, uh, implement storehouse. What about Satoko? Has she forgotten her days of suffering just for a few moments while smiling that brilliant smile she hadn't in so long? This would probably be the longest day of my life. It would be a day I would remember vividly for as long as I lived. I told my parents I'd go to the festival this evening and lounged about during the early afternoon. We may have lived under the same roof, but they couldn't help being surprised by the deviation from how I usually spent my time. Glancing at my parents out of the corner of my eye, I went to the front door. I tied my shoes just a little tighter than normal, as if to express the firmness of my resolve in those knots. When I decided to murder Satoko's uncle, I was in such a state of excitement I almost went crazy. And when I was planning out the act of a murder, which went directly against all the morals fo fostered in me thus far, I was in such a state of calm, I almost thought I had lost my emotions. And then, yesterday, when I learned Satoshi had made exactly the same phone call as me, I didn't know how to describe the muddled feelings I had then. And now, entering today. Right now, I lacked all the emotions I'd, I'd possessed until now. To make a simple analogy, it was the kind of feeling you might get right after you wake up, when you're still half asleep and you don't feel anything very clearly. I had no anger towards that man for the violence he committed against Satoko. I'm sure you'll have plenty of it when you're actually swinging the bat on his stupid mug. Nor did I feel sadness towards or sympathize with her. I felt no discontent towards my friends, who had just waited and watched, never reaching out to her with any, with any help, and no nervousness or fear towards the day that fi had finally come. Yes, right now, you could say I was in the best possible condition for carrying out a murder. When it came down to it, I would probably need to let my violent emotions take control. But right up until that moment, I would be like an insect. I would slowly, surely, and silently move towards my one objective. And then, when I had my prey, I'd attack like a bullet. There was no emotion in that. Just the creeping mindset insects possessed. That sort of sneaking feeling was just the best. I would kill Satoko's uncle like he was a worm. I had to laugh a little at thinking that way. Thinking like an insect. Tug. I tied my laces one more time. And walked out the door. It's a beautiful cloudy day outside. If only people knew what was going to happen. I brought the shovel out of the front storeroom. I would need it to dig the man's grave. The shovel was a convenient one, ma one made for camping. If I twisted it like so and split it into three, I could easily hide it in my bag. I twisted the shovel and dismantled it. And even though I'd done it countless times before, I had trouble for some reason, like I was suddenly clumsy now. I knew why. It wasn't because I was nervous. 
my weak-willed self, deep within me, was hesitant. I knew that the act of dismantling this shovel was the first step I'd take to becoming a murderer. <coughs> the last twist was conspicuously difficult, but finally submitted before the strength of my determination. The area around Satoko's house was outside of my circle of activity. But even just riding my bike in the middle of the day like this might seem suspicious to an observant person. I definitely want to avoid meeting and talking to someone I knew. With that in mind, I chose the route to my destination carefully. I don't mind going the long way around. Of how long this day would be, I could never be too careful after all. Still, I was fortunate enough not to run across anybody on my way to the planned site of the crime. I wasn't superstitious at this point, but it was a good omen. The place I would dig the hole was in this grove, a little further into the woods. I was worried I might not make it to the same place as before, since there were no signs to guide me. But I arrived there as smoothly as expected. I took another look around. Not even a hint of human presence. The air was a little bit damp, but it was comfortable in the cool shade of the trees. I took the disassembled shovel out of my bag and began skillfully putting it together. Then, I stuck the tip of the shovel into a soft looking patch of ground and pushed it on with my foot. The shovel would split into the earth if I put some strength into that foot. The act of doing so seemed awfully like the point of no return, and it made me hesitate. I was just digging a hole with a shovel, but it made me gulp hard. Well, because believe it or not, Keiichi, the act of taking a human life is not exactly easy for the average individual. You're not wrong to feel hesitant. In fact, I'd be worried. I'd be pretty. I'd be pretty concerned if you didn't feel any hesitation at all. Calm down, Keiji Mebara. Let's do a countdown. Get it done on the count of three, okay? All right. One. Two. I couldn't do it on the countdown, despite it just be sticking the, being sticking the shovel into the ground. And I had to count down five or six times. Damn it. I'm just digging a hole. This is pathetic. Just, as I thought that, I put strength into my heel like I was stepping on something unpleasant. And split came the sharp noise. It was only soft at the beginning. Roots and stones quickly got in my way, informed me just how hard it was to dig a hole th and big enough for a person. No decent person would ever come in here anyway. Maybe it would be enough to cover him up with some dirt. Every time my naive thought like that crept into my mind, I bit down on it with my teeth and dug even harder. I've dug enough for now. I could hide him like this. Every time I thought that, I would go down into the hole, grow disappointed at how shallow it was, and return to digging. The thin layer of sweat on my brow eventually formed into drops and fell into the ground. My back was in even worse shape. My damp shirt adhered to my skin, and it felt so disgusting. The things I couldn't stand the most were the mosquitoes. 
Maybe they were attracted by the scent of my sweat. The white and black striped mosquitoes would cling to me whenever I let my guard down. It was hot. It was disgusting. I was sticky. I was itchy. All those uncomfortable feelings surged through me in waves. Damn it all. So what? Are you telling me to pack up and go home? Is that it? I hadn't yelled at anyone. It was me talking to myself. Me telling myself something. Why was I feeling this way and digging a hole all the way out here? What benefit would digging this hole give me? What harm would there be in not digging this hole at all? Wait, in the first place, who ordered me to dig? When I thought it over, maybe ever since grade school, or even before that, my whole life had only been me doing what other people told me to. I didn't mean it was somehow constrained, living a life just based on the command of others. And I didn't mean I was too lazy to try and find my own road in life. Metaphorically speaking, yes, it was like a road. I'd never been particularly physically fit. I didn't hit puberty very early, and if all my classmates and I had gone in a line, I'd usually be on the shorter end. My scores in jump rope competitions and marathons were the very picture of average. And it wasn't like the captains of the dodgeball teams would have a passionate rock-paper-scissors contest to see which would get me. During these, those kindergarten and grade school years, it felt like someone was only worth how fast they grew and how fit they were. Looking back on it now, it was really uncomfortable for me. The thing that turned all that around was just a few words from my mother. Keichi? Keichi? Would you like to go to a cram school? You'll bear grasp what you're learning in school and will be more fun. The very first test I took at cram school was kind of like a game. It was a lot of fun. It wasn't like the tests with the same, the same exact problems dozens of times in a row. Every question had a picture out to it, almost like one of those puzzle books that came with manga magazines. If my studies at school had been like this, it would have been way more fun. Several days later, I went to the cram school again with my mother and the enrollment pa paperwork. Mom and the person at the cram school had a really long, heated discussion, so I accidentally dozed off and missed most of what they said. But I clearly remember one point. Mom had made a loud groan, surprised at something. <laughs> Um, by 61, do you mean his average score was 61 points? Yeah, No, not at all, Miss Maibara. The mean deviation of our cram schools all across the country is 61. He's showing rare numbers, even if this was just a simplified intelligence examination. First, I would like to say that Keichi Meibara-kun is extremely bright. Keichi? But he doesn't have very good grade at, grades at schools. Well, fun fact, there, are, there have been known cases of uh, actual geniuses in, in real life that, uh, didn't do well at, that didn't do well at school. For one, for some reason or another, I think uh, 
no, no, uh, what? Stephen Hawking, I think. I think Stephen Hawking was one when he went to university and the like. You know, the, uh, you know, the, the guy in the, in the chair that couldn't speak or anything like that and had to use a little robot voice in order to speak for himself. I think he was one example, if memory serves. I don't remember if Albert Einstein, Albert Einstein was one. But, uh, yeah. The thing about, the thing about, uh, geniuses is that they don't have, uh, set personalities and all the like, just like anybody else do. Some people, they, they can, they can, uh, perform well or perform poorly at school just like anybody else. It all depends on the individual and, well, how they, how they fit into whatever school system that they're a part of. Like, they have trouble with authority figures in general, then, well, naturally that would, uh, by default, hamper their ability to excel in uh, public in public school systems and the like. Not the not the best explanation I can give here because it's been a while since I even thought about this topic. But it does happen. It has happened before. Instances of actual bright people just simply not having great good grades in school when they grew up, actually growing up here to be experts and true experts in their field. Or in their or in their hobbies or passions, whatever it is they end up doing it later in life. It's like to me it, that that's just basically a sign here that uh, to me that's just basically a sign here that you don't have to be a genius in order to excel at school. You just have to simply be good at taking notes, paying attention, and the like, and that. Just because you have, and that, and also by contrast, that just because you might have a poor grade in something doesn't necessarily make you stupid. It just means that maybe you learn things at a different pace or in a different way than some of your peers do. That doesn't make you hope. That doesn't make you hopeless. We're all different, but that doesn't. But just because you're different doesn't mean you're stupid. You know. He has average marks on his report card. B's, C's, D's. Is there some kind of mistake? I think it's a mistake. We cross-checked with several tests as well, and we learned some very interesting things as a result. Maibara-kun has a very strong problem with the meaning of the meaning. Nebarakun is extremely weak when faced with questions that don't have any meaning. He just has no interest in simple, dull questions that don't have to do with everyday life. Well, I was like that too with a lot of things growing up. I had trouble retaining I had trouble retaining things in uh, retain things in school that I felt. I wouldn't have any real use in my normal everyday life, either in the present or growing up. So, with that plot process in mind, it just, yeah, why why should I really care all that much, if only beyond just simply remembering things just to pass whatever tests that teachers would give me? That makes me sound lazy. So even if he doesn't know what 2 plus 3 is, if you told him he had two apples and then got three more, he would understand that sort of question? That's right. For example, instead of telling him to draw a flattened, foldable cube, what if we asked him what a die would look like when cut open? If we did that, he can answer beautifully. See what I mean? This is just this this sort of thing was just what I was talking about. Some people some people are just different are different with how they approach problems. Or approach, you know, their learning education in general. You just gotta find the right approach for the right person. Then the person from the cram school showed her pa showed her a page from one of the exams I took. It was a paper with questions about construction. 
construction questions were so were were unusual. So they were really cool, weren't they? 正二重面体の展開図を書けという問題です。In this question, it asks to draw an unfolded regular icosahedron, a shape with 20 faces. When we rephrased it and asked him how he would cut out a piece of cardboard to create a 20 sided die, to Kikinaoshita, Keichikun wa, samo kantan so ni koreo kaite mi semashita. Keichikun drew the answer as though it were easy. これは平凡なことではありません。This is not something an average child could can do. ケイチ。ケイチ。あなたどこかの本の雑誌の付録か何かで二重面体のサイコロを作ったことがあったの。Have you ever made a die with twenty sides from a magazine extra or anything? Dice only went from one to six. Depends on the dice. I never even considered before this test that there were dice with more than six sides. So it was fun to imagine what kind of shape a die that went up to 20 would have. If I had a die like that, I could win a dice game against anyone. So I immediately wanted to make it. Finally, I entered cram school. There were only four students in the class they put me in, which was called Select. It was the highest class, and some of my classmates were in lower classes. And when I remembered how much better they had done at things like dodgeball and the 50 meter sprint, I felt happiness swell up within me for the first time. Even if I wasn't as good at, as, at them physically, I triumphed over them in other ways. It was fun at first. The more I did, the more I was praised. My teachers at school suddenly started pampering me, and it felt good. My parents were satisfied too. And I enjoyed seeing them satisfied. The more I listened to my parents' commands, the more fun things got. It did happen, didn't it? I grinned dryly in self deprecation. Because, well, my studious lifestyle didn't end up lasting very long. It was only at the beginning I enjoyed learning more and more. I gradually got along less with my friends. Why is that? What happened? My classes were behind what I was give what I were behind what I was learning in cram school, and I eventually stopped respecting the teachers, given that they could that they could put me to sleep with their lectures. And well, I was a disagreeable sort who bragged a lot about how much I knew. And the ways of the world wouldn't let me remain in that state of ecstasy forever. I would do as I was told. Then I'd go above and beyond their expectations. And then they praised me. I was happy for that, and the cycle repeated itself like the wheels on a bike. I thought moving forward like that was how life worked like a bicycle. When I moved to Hinamazawa, I realized just how inadequate it was. Some things happened, and we started saying how moving and getting a change in atmosphere would be nice. And then my father, he had a place that he liked, that he'd gone up to a few times to draw the nature. He started saying that he wanted to bring his at atelier there. With me in blank amazement, they decided to move to Hinamizawa. And after that, I. I met them, didn't I? The first day after transferring here, I went to the classroom with the teacher. 
I find it interesting how we actually start learning a decent bit more about Keiichi's upbringing and his life before moving to Hinomizawa. All the way, he, well, here in chapter three, three rather than uh, chapter one. I would have expected that this is the sort of information we'd we'd uh, learn about him right from the get-go, or at least very close to it. So, yeah, it's a little bit interesting. I went to the classroom with the teacher. I thought it would seem pitiful for her to bring me in there. So I placed my hand on the door before she could, slammed it open, and set foot into the room. Clatter. The thrilling, powerful way I opened that door was none other than my own determination to try doing my life over again. And then, within seconds, that determination took a hard counter to the face. A blackboard eraser fell on me. Even right from the very beginning, the trap master got caught you and caught you in her web. That's precious. Plus, there was a huge rock inside. It was a supremely painful trap someone had set up. Oh, come on. Satoka was already beating me right from the first day I transferred. That frightened me. I was bewildered. The class was surprised, too. I wasn't just surprised that the students in the class were all in different grades and were different group genders. It was because the room felt completely different from the schools I knew. And as I spend more time with them, my surprise continued to grow. This fresh sense of surprise had never left my life, even to this day. Every day was a fresh new surprise. I never had a single boring day since coming here. The days were lively, spent with the other club members. I'm sorry, but I just gotta s simply voice this. For some, I I'm I'm just ha having a little trouble trouble understanding how someone like Keiichi, who was apparently very bright in in school growing up before coming to Hinamazawa, that this is the same Keiichi who basically almost said he burned his house down trying to cook a bento box, in the fashion that he did. It's just like, are we are you sure we're talking about the same fucking Keiichi here? And not some identical twin or something? Sorry, I, I just had to get that out there. The days were lively, spent with the other club members. We played old maid with cards with scratches on the back to cheat. We let all our passions go wild during our games. We all went out as regular participants in tournaments at the toy store in town, and many, many more things. Recently during those times, there was the bento competition. It was then. That's when I saw an unexpected side to Satoko. Thinking back on it, I only ate dinner with her two nights. It was such sweet, gentle time spent and it warmed my heart remembering it even now. I realized that Satoko was pretending to be stubborn and firm, and how brave she was. Part of her, part of her heart always waiting for her Nini to come home. And I vowed to become her Nini. Satoko may have been nagging and overly critical, but she knew how to take care of someone. But though it, may, though it might have seemed like she was taking the lead, it was actually her way of, depen of depending upon another person. Even if Satoshi and Satoko's lives as, li lived lives as siblings were confined by their uncle and his wife, they were still warm, sunny days. When did those sunny days all go wrong? What mistake was made? 
lamenting tragedies of the past would do no good. And I told myself that so many times. But I did anyway. Keiichi, isn't that why you chose your own path? To take back that life? Nobody ordered you to do this. You decided it on your own. You don't desire anyone's praise for this. You thought it all through yourself. You'll carve it out yourself. And you'll do it now. This wasn't a path I could see very far down. Probably because it's not a very long path at all, if you know what I mean. Not like the road parents or society could offer. It was a narrow path, dark and utterly distressing, one for which the next step would always be shrouded in darkness. But that disheartening path would keep on going forever. It was an unlimited path, and there was nowhere I couldn't travel. The kind of path only available to those able to imagine where they wanted to go. Don't be ashamed at breaking from the brightly lit paved road. In fact, feel proud that you found your very own path to walk. And I hadn't discarded the, pa the, the paved road either. Once I achieved my goal, I would go back to that bright road. And then, I'd spend those average sunny days at my leisure. Crush. When I next realized it, the hole had grown so deep I couldn't believe it. Well, getting lost in thought will help with that. Did I dig this up? I'll dig all this myself. I think digging this much is enough, right? I put my shovel into the bottom of the hole. I drag the body here and throw it into the hole and cover it up with dirt. Even if it took me time to camouflage it by putting plants on top, it would all grow it would all go much more easily than digging this hole had. I glanced at my watch. It was almost evening, and I hadn't realized it. I may not have felt the time passing, but digging a hole this deep must have taken quite a lot of time. I took a seat on the slanted rock nearby and wiped the sweat from my brow. Now, once it got a little darker, I'd go get the metal bat I hid in the schoolyard. Then I'd make the, the call to lure him out. And then, I'd do it. The number of things I needed to do to reach that moment were dwindling. I felt that moment closing in on me much more keenly than I did the passage of time. I didn't have any hesitation, but I still felt that. A contradiction. At every step in this process, I had a few chances to hesitate. To turn back. To let myself lose my nerve. Having to endure those million temptations and wait for when the time was right was an indescribably slow and painful torture. I had thought myself acting all weak because of that, but I stopped midway through. This was okay. It was fine. I could detest the abnormal act of homicide as much as I wanted, and it didn't matter. I wasn't going to... <clears throat> I wasn't going to be a cutthroat killer after today. I would pass through this strange day and go back to the world I was in before. I fell to the level of a psychopath who thought nothing of killing. If I fell to the level of a psychopath who thought nothing of killing, I wouldn't be able to go back to my old life. So this was fine with me. 
I didn't have to feel ashamed at hesitating to kill. Because I was human. It was so funny to me that I'd be the bearer of Oryashiro Sama's curse at the same time I was aware I was human. I exhaled lightly and stood. I concealed my presence and sharpened my senses in all directions to search for anyone around but me. Okay. Let's go. One step at a time. I would walk my own path. A path no one had forced me to walk. Let's do this. Maebara Keichi. Keichi Maebara. The Kikadas made an annoying fuss. Their chorus covered up the suspicious noise of me breaking twigs underfoot. And their chorus filled the path far ahead of me, letting me know I would be alone for some time. The Kikadas blessed the path I walked. Encouraged me with every last ounce of strength they had. Sure they're not encouraging you to stop what you're doing? The sky was far above. And not even an hour, the veil of night would draw near, and the sky would be tinted with dusk. By that time, the Higurashi would let me hear their chorus in place of the Kikadas. When that happened, would everything be over with? Would everything have ended? I said something along those lines when I left Satoko's fate up to a public agency. But this time was different. I would do it. I would carry it out and possibly end up ruining Satoko's life in the process. You dumb fool. You well-meaning, but dumb fool. I would end it. He would be all over very soon. Everything would end. Yes, and Higurashi cried. I'll give you I'll give you points for one thing, Keichi. You're doing a decent job of building up the tension for me. Leading up to the moment. There was nobody at school. As far as you know. I couldn't hear the playful voices of children. This was the first time I'd seen the school with such a lack of human presence. Still, I quieted my breath and looked around, not wanting to be unprepared. It had gotten darker outside, but it was almost like my eyes could see more clearly now. I made absolutely sure of my safety, then walked to the heavy construction machine I'd hidden the metal bat behind. I had a tinge of worry, a premonition, that someone had found the bat and hidden it somewhere else as a prank. If that happened, would I take that as an opportunity to desist? If, if it really wasn't there, then... The sensation of chilled metal. Well, shit, and here I was hoping that someone actually did take it. It was still here where I left it. It hadn't run away. Satoshi hadn't run away. He'd waited here patiently. For me. Sorry for the wait, Satoshi. It's been a long time coming. You prepared for this? 
Through the metallic touch, Satoshi grinned at me in my mind. That's why I want, should be asking. That's what I should be asking, you know. I did this last year already. You should be more worried about yourself. Right on, Satoshi. Let's show him a bad time. Satoshi's bat got lighter and lighter and fit into my hands like it was being absorbed. It didn't feel wrong to swing this. I could move it around so naturally, it was like an extension of my own right arm. Of course it felt like that. Satoshi and I were holding one bat together. Next, I would make the call to lure the man out. It wasn't a bad time for it. My friends were doubtlessly parading happily through the stalls. I hadn't considered where to make the call from. My house and Satoko's were pretty, par a free, pretty far apart. If I called from my house, I wouldn't make it. Couldn't I use the school phone? But, as I thought, the room was locked up and I couldn't get in. Shit. I'm so naive. You should have at least figured this part out. I couldn't call him. And just for that, today was all was today all over. I want well, I would strongly encourage you to say to tell yourself, yes, today's over. Everything's ruined. Go home. Or go to or go to the festival after all and come up with some other bullshit excuse as to how you were able to make it. But I know you're not gonna give up, so instead I will simply tell you where there's a will, there's a way. You could always just break into the school if you don't care about uh, busting a window. Sorry, Satoshi. And just as I cursed my own naivety, a miracle occurred. A bicycle came into the schoolyard. It was a familiar middle-aged man. The one from the Forest Service Field Office. Why? Wasn't, wasn't, wasn't today Sunday? Was he here to pick something up he forgot? Anyway. The forest officer went around back and felt around in his pocket, then unlocked a door and entered. <gasps> De Deus Ex Forest Ranger! Or is it Forest Ranger Ex Machina? The best possible coincidence, and it had to be Satoshi who saved me. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Satoshi magically called the, the magically called the forest ranger here to open the door for you. Maybe he's got a cell phone. The ma the metal bat, through mo just my contact with it, told me this was a chance I couldn't allow to slip by. The sections for the forest office and the school were vi were neatly separated. I felt the man. I felt the man head into the forest office's storehouse, which was so far in this back suit in the back, students weren't allowed into it. The door didn't match its fittings well, so it didn't close all the way, and the gap in the door opened slowly as if to lure me in. I took a deep breath and went in. I tiptoed along, silently and stealthily. And made my way into the, and made it into the teacher's lounge. That was the only place with a phone. And there's still a curry dish just sitting there. Come on, teach. Don't be lazy. Throw out your food when you're not done with when you're done with it. As I held my breath in the teacher's lounge, I heard the Forest Service officer walking back over. Then the black door clattered shut, 
and was locked. Oh no, you're locked in. Whatever shall you do? And yes, I know he can just unlock the door from the inside. I glanced out the window at the schoolyard and watched as the man got on his bike like nothing had happened and rode out the school gate. The school once again emptied, becoming deathly silent. I waited for a bit to make sure the silence was the real deal, then reached for the telephone on the principal's desk. I fished Satoko's house phone number out of my pocket. Yes, the number in the class directory, directory for Satoko had been the one from their house now, where she lived with her uncle. I touched the dial with my fingers, and then thought for a moment about what to say exactly when he picked up. Despite how many times I'd gone over in my head last night, now that I had my fingers on the dial like this, it started to seep out of my mind like a cracked bucket leaking water. You should have written yourself a note, man. Simple would be best. More importantly, to say it straight and not sound suspicious. I counted off three heartbeats and spun the dial. The call sound was Satoko's uncle pick up. Now, of all times, the hope that he wouldn't pick up, and the feeling of doom and the knowledge that I couldn't save Satoko if he didn't, whirled around in a vortex. Hello? Hello, asshole. It was the voice of a grumpy man, like he had just woken up. He picked up. Hello? Say your name so I know you're Hojo, you asshole. It'd be terrible if I got it wrong. I made up my mind. I had all the initiative on my side. Here we go. This is the Shishibone this is the Shishibone Okinomiya police station. Am I speaking to the Hoju residents? I was changing my voice, but did he really think I sounded like an adult? Would he believe I was the police? Uh, hi. Oh. Yes. Hojo this is Hojo. We currently have your daughter, Satoko Hojo, here with us. Eh? What? Satoko? Satoko? What did that brat do? He fell for it. I could tell by how tense he was that he didn't doubt my words. I can explain the particulars once you have arrived here. Would you mind coming to the station right away? Right now? I already took a bath myself, so I didn't really want to go out, I'll go out like this, though. Wow! You can actually bathe yourself! And here I was, thinking that you were completely hopeless around the house. What?! You don't want to come because you already took a bath? Yes, right away. Right away. Jeez, man. What the heck did Satoko do? I'll explain once you're here. I'll be waiting. Thank you for your assistance. Ah! 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 One second. I don't know where the police station is. Where am I going? Uh. You moron. What the hell? The Okinomiya police station. I... I don't know where it is either. Then you're both morons. 
Aren't you from around here? Why don't you know that? A greasy sweat came over my body. Eventually, just as I was about to choke, he spoke. Oh, next to the fire station, right? It's pretty far. My goodness, he remembered on his own for me. I didn't care where the police station was. So long as he's left his house to get there. Then we will be waiting here. Oh, wait. Who am I asking for once I get there? What is your name? On top of that, he wanted to know my name? Well, you're gonna kill him anyway, so what's the harm in telling him your what's what's the harm in telling him your your name? Just leave your goddamn house already. Maibashi. Excuse me. That was close. I almost thoughtlessly told him my real name. I managed to change the last syllable of it, but... I put the receiver down like I was running away. My fingers were trembling, and I was soaked with a tepid sweat. I wasn't just nervous about the phone call. With that call, everything had finally been put into motion. I left the school. It was locked before, but it was easy enough to open from the inside. But I couldn't lock it again after I left. Isn't it... Well, isn't a knob like one of those knobs where you can lock it, where you can have the door open, lock it from the inside, and then still be able to close the door? Just test that out first. In terms of being thorough, I wanted to lock it. But I couldn't waste time going back to the teacher's lounge and looking for the key. I need to rush back as fast as I could and ambush him. I zoomed back to the scene on my bike. If Satoko's uncle got out of town before I got there, everything would be over. He'd learned there was no one at the station named Maibashi, and things would get pretty messed up. As I, was, as I returned at full speed, I passed a family wearing, wearing yakuta, y uh, yukatas. They must have been on their way to the festival. Many people in Himazawa knew my face. No I, di no, I didn't know theirs. Even just passing by them like this made me uneasy. But I didn't generally come around here, so the those living in the area might not have known much about me. That didn't matter right now. I need to get back as fast as possible to control my breathing and to ambush the man. I hid my bike in a thicket and picked up Satoshi's bat, which I just left hidden in the, in the shade. And then I held my breath, waiting to see someone. Now we wait. I wondered if he still hadn't gotten here. Or maybe he went right out after the phone call and passed by here already? I couldn't figure out which it was and was set upon by an indescribable impatience. Calm down, Keiji Mebara. Even if he came here already, he'd pass by here on the way back, right? The end result would be the same. It wouldn't change the fact that he'd die. He'd probably be coming on his motorcycle. How would I stop him then? Well, you could always time it. As he's passing by, just swing your bat out right as he's about to pass by your hiding place and watch him go flying off his bike. Simple physics, my friend. 
I figured it would be best not to think too hard and just hit him as he passed, or beat him out of his seat. The path was made of pebbles. If I hit him as hard as I could and made him lose his balance, he wouldn't be able to help falling. And then, the chorus of the Higurashi stopped. The sound of a bike approached from far away. Here we go. I couldn't tell what sort of motorcycle it was from its sound, but I'd seen it part before, so I'd know. It was getting rapidly closer. It was almost here. If he just went a little farther, he'd cross into that thicket and appear in front of me. I'd take a moment to make sure it was him. Then when I had... When I had... I put my plan into action. The motorcycle appeared. A few easily identifiable characteristics told me it was Satoko's uncle's bike, without a doubt. Was... It really him? Was it really Satoko's uncle? I wasn't making a mistake. Was I? One way to find out. I looked at its characteristics again. Its color, shape, and most of all, the man's clothes. And face! Those last feelings of hesitation. I did away with them. Satoko. Now, your Nini will end it, okay? Closer. Closer. The bike came closer. Let's go. Satoshi! <sighs> yeah. Holy shit, we actually heard a line from Satoshi. Are you here? Are you in is your are you dead and is your spirit inhabiting your bat? Or is Keiichi just losing his marbles again? Whoosh! I jumped out of the thicket. I used my shoulder to basically tackle the uncle on the bike with all my might. <laughs> He gave a dumb shout as his bike completely lost its balance. Finally it fell, the bike scattering clouds of sand, and after spinning, it stopped. Her uncle, tossed to the ground, didn't understand what just happened, and groaned for a few moments, crouched on the ground. My breathing started to become ragged. No, I couldn't have this emotion. Some weird secretion crossed through my brain and nearly made me hallucinate. Her uncle was groaning. That was the once in a lifetime opportunity. What was I doing? All the sounds in the world cut off. My mental chaos from a moment ago withdrew like a lie, and I could feel the temperature in my head rapidly cooling down. The tension in my muscles all went away, like the strings that they'd been attached, attached to had been cut, and I let my, emotion, my hands dangle at my sides. It wasn't quite like exhaustion. Have you calmed down now? Keichi Mebara. Do you need to remember again why things got to this point today? Scrape. Scrape. I stepped over the pebbled path, taking one step, another step, then another towards Satoko's uncle. The more I walked, the more my breathing calmed. 
The more I walked, the more I felt like my body cooling, calming, chilling with frost. This is your- this is literally your last fucking chance to back out, man. Just putting that out there. Yes. At this moment, this guy had lost permission to live. I had just resented it. So he mustn't stay in this world any longer. If he lived any longer, if Satoko's misfortune continued, it would be my responsibility for having allowed him to live. I could feel a cooling substance going through my whole body, even down to my capillaries. Her uncle was at my feet now, still on the ground like an idiot. I smiled coldly at how ridiculous he looked. <laughs> that hurt. <laughs> That's all it took. For it to hurt? Satoko's heart hurt much more. And now, you're gonna feel that. And with your life, I'll make up for her pain. I erased all unnecessary information from my mind. I prioritized the murder of this man. Execute. 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 Wham! Utterly calmly, I delivered my first strike to the back of his head. Prepare for unforeseen consequences. That's all I have left to say to you at this point, Keiichi. Well, unforeseen for you, anyway. I wanted to get the most effective spot. At least during that first moment, I'd have to attack him while he was at his most defenseless. <laughs> And if he was hit in the head, he'd cover his head. It was a defensive reaction all humans made, like machines. He used both hands to cover his head, so he couldn't pick himself up off of the heap he was in on the ground. Like, hit, like pounding a cat pillar into the dirt, I hit him over and over. If he covered his head, I'd hit him in the side. If he covered his body, I'd go for his head. If he rolled over, I'd strike his feet, his knees, his elbows. I didn't care where anymore. By just delivering one blow after another, I induced panic in him. I retained my overwhelming advantage. I hadn't done nearly enough to deliver a fatal wound. Her uncle skillfully pulled himself up off the ground and started to run like a fleeing rabbit. It wasn't a judgment he made after seeing my face and deciding whether to fight me. Right now, he was fleeing by instinct just trying to escape from the threat that had presented itself. A counterattack from the more physically capable uncle was what I was most concerned about. He may have he may have run, but it wasn't all that unlucky. And the odds were in my favor. The uncle didn't run away towards people, but off the path and into the woods. How pleasant that he would run in a direction where nobody else was. He was fleeing into strange geography, like a rat that instinctively runs into tight spots over and over. Yes, he was no longer human. He was a rat. The blood vessels in my legs expanded, and my total oxygen supply increased. I lowered myself to gain the most velocity I could. Without breathing, I became a wind-like shadow and dashed. 
I crossed thickets, crushed dead tree branches underfoot, and dove through the woods like a bullet. He ran so cowardly, arms flailing as he went. After catching up to him, I didn't need so much as a, a blink of an eye to strike him again. My senses, mind, and body were all sharpened purely to kill this man. This was the first time I'd felt like this. Well, this was the first experience I'd ever had killing someone. It felt natural continuing to do this for the first time. And that meant I had this much talent for killing. Or perhaps the act of killing was so simple that anyone could do it. If oh, well, if that was true, there'd be a shit ton more murders in the world. I didn't struggle or grow tired at all chasing the, clums the clumsily fleeing uncle. No matter how much he ran, it was like trying to get away from his own shadow. He couldn't get away from me. I could easily aim at his back, his shoulder, and his head even from this unnatural stance. Each time I struck him, he wailed in pain and begged pitifully for forgiveness but it didn't disturb my mind. I was neither excited nor plagued by hesitation like before. I felt sharp. I felt like a carnivore. Of course, so did the uncle, who was trying to run away because he didn't want to die. He didn't want to be eaten, like a herbivore running with all its might, trying to get away. Despite all the attacks, despite all the hits, he kept on fleeing without even staggering. And despite the bad footing in the forest, he impressively never tripped over anything. But there was no need to admire that fact. It was simply proof that he was no more than an animal. If he was chased, he would run. If he was going to be killed, he would run. He barred his fangs at the weak, but couldn't oppose the strong whatsoever. He was lowly, vulgar, a diminutive animal. Such a puny little creature. Had harmed Satoko. Scar after scar to her body and mind. Deep wounds that might never not, might, might not ever go away as long as she lived. Hell! <laughs> <sighs> My cold and calm emotions suddenly turned into bestial ones. My personality changed into something specialized for murder, purely to devour the diminutive animal before me. Told you all that rage would come back at this moment, Keiichi. I know you better than you do. <laughs> the uncle gave a puny little shriek, covered his head, and ran, ran, ran. I'm impressed by how much you can run. Fine, run as much as you like. I will be your death. I will choose the moment at my leisure. Your legs will hurt. Your lungs will feel about to burst. Your head will hurt from lack of oxygen. If you feel the pain has become worse than death, then by all means, stop any time. Without turning back, suffocating on his terror of the approaching death, he just ran shamefully onward. He ran, but was chased. His head bashed with the metal bat. Sweat and drool flying everywhere, blood clinging to him. From his mouth came the sounds of coarse, irregular breathing and high-pitched screaming that verged on crying. And pleas for forgiveness to someone. I didn't know who. 
Each and every second was a second of atonement that I granted him. Now, run, 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 run! Then moan, then fall, and moan, and die! Where'd you even crawl out of anyway? You were never here before. If you were never here, you never should have showed up. If you never showed up, our lives would still be fun and enjoyable. I strongly disagree with you on that one. My evidence is the first two chapters. We would have gone to the festivals to today's festival, waited for each other, and gone to the shrine, laughing. We would have been playing amongst the stalls right about now. We'd be browsing up the strange food stalls you only saw at festivals, trying to get prizes from goldfish scooping, ring throwing, or target practice. Neon would surely make it into a competition, and we, as a club, would have a grand time. And everyone would have been cheering for Rika Chan's dedication dance. And everyone would say how fun it was. And it would give us energy for days to come. Fun, enjoyable, and funny. Warm time spent with friends. And that would have happened. But it didn't. And now it was all smashed to pieces! There was no doubt that would be what the world was like if you never showed up! You naive fool. If only you knew. You were the obstacle. The mistake. The heresy, the heresy in that world. But I'd correct that mistake now. I would erase you and make it so this last week never happened. Tonight was the Watanagashi Festival. The holy night where taking just one life was permitted in the name of Urashiro-sama's curse. <sighs> it looks like the Higurashi stopped crying at some point. When the Higurashi cried, everything would end. And the Higurashi silenced. Lully won. The Hour of Atonement is at an end. The Higurashi have stopped their crying. Thus, this is the end. The end, the end, the end. End! You don't have to run away anymore. Die! With those dirty brains of yours smashed everywhere! Gah! Lightning and thunder struck like an explosion. It was so loud it shook the ground, and I smelled gunpowder. The response I got this time was clearly different from the one before. Interesting. It's raining this time around during the festival, but I'm pretty sure it didn't rain in the last two chapters. I wonder why the metal bat crunched into the crown of his head. It was like the top of his head had caved in. The bat felt like it was biting him. It had been the final killing attack that visited him. When I didn't overlook the opening, he left as his knees gave out under him. I remained alert for a few moments, then thud, thud. He planted both knees in the ground, and then fell forwards, burying his head in the ground. <laughs> Well, you did it. You took his life. Like I said, I hope you're prepared for everything that's going to happen from this point onward, because there is no turning back now. 
I gave you fair warning. Your in, your inner self gave you fair warning. Meon even get, indirectly gave you warning. Well, maybe not, maybe not a warning, but I mean her reaction, her reaction to you asking, her asking her to take Meon. I mean, not, I mean Satoko to the festival should have been enough of a of a war, warning on its own. And yet you ignored all the warning signs, all the red flags, all the all the opportunities to turn back. No more time for regrets. I've been holding back my ragged breathing. But now it all came out of me like a dam bursting. My head was dizzy and light and unable to maintain my balance. I learned it, I leaned against a nearby tree. The uncle didn't try and guard his head any longer. After a disgusting sort of spasm, he stopped moving. Did I get him? Did I get him? For sure? I fought back against my exhausted urge to fall over where I stood and drew towards him carefully. That still the ready. It was possible he was faking it and trying to wait it out. With that head injury you just dealt him, I sincerely doubt it. Should I check for a pulse? I realized right away, though, how unnecessary that would be. As I thought he might be faking it, then I would just have to keep pummeling him until I was satisfied. I fought back my ragged breathing again, and then I swung the bat far above and brought it down. His body leaped like a bow, but he didn't try and cover his head. Then once again, I aimed for his head and swung. His reaction was the same this time. After spending a few moments making his head into mochi, the, gr the hits gradually started to feel different and started to spray a filthy, dark red liquid everywhere. That was enough. It was definite now. I had absolutely killed him. There was no sense of accomplishment nor one of regret. I didn't feel anger towards Satoko's uncle, nor pity towards Satoko herself. Instead, right now, I was feeling like my heart had been stolen by the downpour. It had begun to rain at some point, and how comfortable it felt. The rainwater drenched my body and dripped down to the ground. The excitement within me faded as the rain washed away the grime. In the exchange, my shoes were so wet they made splashing sounds. And despite abusing Satoshi's bat like that, it wasn't bent very much. There were a few dents in it, probably from hitting the man, but nothing that would make it seem different from before. To the unobservant eye, maybe. Instead, it had been stained with black, with red, with mud and blood. But that itself would be evidence. The one piece of evidence needed to prove that my delusions had just been daydreams, and that I'd ended Satoko's uncle for all eternity. All right, Keiichi. On your mind. The time for passion is over. Now is the time to be cold as ice. I need to bury the body. But where was I? 
I simply followed the man as far as he ran into the darkness. I couldn't take a guess as to how far we'd run. It was already pitch black around us. And the only light I had to go on was the very faint lights on the road a little further down. It was so dark out. I hadn't noticed the darkness until just now. My vision was so good I could see the man's ugly hairline. I could have counted the pores on his head. In his head. It was only now that I realized how much crazy strength I had mustered at that moment. I went over to the streetlight. I looked up and down the road, desperately trying to figure out where I was. Kokoa? This is... Oh no. This was the ro one road connecting Hinamazawa to the town. We were... unbelievably far away from Satoko's house. Had the two of us really run so far a distance? My surprise at that was accompanied by knowledge of the miraculous fact that despite running so far and making so much noise, we hadn't come across anybody at all. There was a long way between here and the ambush location where I dug up the hole. There was no way I could carry the body that far. Wait, aside from that, the bike the man took here was still laying, lying in the middle of that path. That would be an issue. The police could tell it was most cycle it was by looking at its license plate. And they wouldn't just leave it at that. Thankfully, the corpse was in a dark forest. In terms of urgency, dealing with the bike would come, would come first. And I wanted to get the shovel back from where I'd left it next to the hole. I shouldn't drag the body there. I would have to deal with it right here. Fortunately, the ground was like mud from the downpour and was more sludgy here than where I was before. I might be able to dig a grave quickly here. Of course, my bicycle was still over where I left it too. Still, wasn't over. Homicide had only been half of my goal. The other half would be just as important as the first. I completely hide the body, not allowing the beginning to happen. I would erase the man like he never existed, and regain the peaceful times we had before. I bent my head backwards and calmed my mind even further. The big war, the big war droplets stuck my brow, struck my brow mercilessly. They were actually quite comfortable, and for a while I let my desire have its way. After confirming that I was sharp again, I started running through the rain. The motorcycle was in the grass at the roadside. Considering how it looked, pelted with rain and covered in mud, it actually seemed like it had been lying there for a very long time. The plan was to drop the motorcycle into the swamp. The swamp was a bit of a walk from here. I lifted the bike up. I didn't think it would be so heavy. I was a little surprised. But once I had it up upright, it was fairly easy to roll along, roll it along. Still, pushing this thing all the way to the swamp was not was really not something I wanted to do. You could try riding it. I could no longer ignore my exhaustion, and it warned me numerous times of how far away the swamp was. This motorcycle. I wonder if I could ride it well enough. Once I got it going, it would be basically the same as a bicycle. 
Wouldn't it get me to the swamp quickly? The plan suggested my, by my exhaustion. The anxiety I had to getting on a motorcycle for the first time lift drill. I turned the key, and then you just kicked this pedal, right? Yeah! Yeah! Vroom. It's on. And then I grip the handlebars. First the right, then the left. <laughs> Maybe I twist them too much. The bike lurched and did a wheelie like an angry horse. I lost it for a second. But it was just a problem of how much torque to apply. Let's try that again. This time slowly. Gently. That time it went well. It was strange to be on a two-wheeled vehicle that would go even if I didn't pedal. Very odd, but I got used to it quickly. Mion once told me you could get a scooter license within a day, and she was clearly right. This was pretty easy. I need to throw the metal bat into the swamp, too. But I didn't know how I, how I would pack the bat onto, onto the motorcycle. Well, you better hope, then, that nobody goes look in well, snooping in Satoshi's locker and notices that the bat is missing. But I didn't know how I would pack the bat onto the motorcycle. Without much other choice, I stuffed it into the back of my shirt, feeling like a ninja carrying a katana. If I put the tip down the seat of my pants and hunched over, it wouldn't fall out. I got back on the bike and this time, got going without any difficulty. I carefully pressed the button labeled light, and a rather strong light came on, illuminating the way forward. I probably shouldn't have turned it on, but I didn't have any way of seeing at this point and had zero confidence I could ride through this darkness. As the rain came down on me, I maintained a precarious balance and inched my way towards the swamp. Along the way, I ran across a few people who seemed to be returning from the festival. But none of them had any interest in me. They were all either soaked through with the rain and hurrying on their ways home, or had their umbrellas low and their heads down. Yesterday day I might have been wary of even these passerby, but right now it didn't seem to be much of cause for concern. In fact, it would probably be less suspicious to be riding out in the open like this instead of sneaking around. More and more though, I started to think of that idea as naive brought on by my exhausted state. I climbed a steep hill. On a bike, the hill would have put me out of breath. But I just, ha but I just had to accelerate a little bit to climb the entire thing. Most motorcycles sure are convenient. For a moment, its, li its lights illuminated a sign before I passed it by it. Onikafuchi Swamp. Good children do not play around here. Still, it wasn't like the way to the swamp was cordoned off by a metal fence or anything. Parents and teachers would get mad at you if they found out you were playing at the swamp. But some of the bad kids in my class apparently snuck out here sometimes to see the giant crayfish in the place. They talked about... about they talked about before about how they go to the candy shop and buy some pickled squid and then just tie it to a fishing line and throw it and all the crayfish would come running. Once I got up to the bank, there was a tiny ritual shrine and traditional ropes on one of the trees. And as it swallowed a downpour hole, the blackened swamp had waited for me.
if I slammed on the accelerator from the cliff-like cliff stop I was on now, the thing would fly straight into the middle of the swamp. I had to be careful not to fall in with it. If I drowned and disappeared... Man, what a stupid ghost story that would be. You would basically be our demon away person this year. And uh, Satoko's uncle would be the person who was murdered. And conveniently, he happens to have Hojo as a last name. So, it would fit with the, it would fit with all the all the previous year's uh, murders and disappearances. On the night of watching Nagashi, Satoko's uncle's corpse was found in a th um, was found in a thicket by the road leading to town, and Keiji Mebara went missing. People would whisper that I'd been demoned away. The fifth year's curse would be a half-baked one. I got off the bike and twisted the accelerator as hard as I could. I let go just when it seemed like it would drag me forward. The bike shot off the cliff and was swallowed down into the swamp, leaving a far fainter splash than I'd imagined. Its surface was being pummeled by the downpour, and the muddy, filthy water was flowing into it. I couldn't even make out the motorbike I'd just thrown in there. It was pretty heavy, after all. It would be quickly engulfed by the soft mud at the bottom of the swamp and it would be pulled deeper and deeper until it reached hell itself. I felt no reluctance whatsoever in throwing the man's motorbike down to the land of the demons. But I did have a tinge of regret when I, when I did it with Satoshi's bat. The muddy water washed off the gore sticking to it, and it sunk easily. I had sort of shared today's events with Satoshi, so I wanted to give it a quiet place to stay. That's how I felt. I started to feel more like returning it to the locker from before, so it could continue to keep watch over Satoko. Satoshi. Satoshi. I... Probably well. Misunderstood you. Satoshi listened quietly, without nodding. I am absolutely convinced now. You were the one who beat your aunt to death last year and saved Satoko. I always scorned you and called you a coward who ran away. But I was wrong. To the rest of the world, some deviant was behind that incident. But I know that was something you did for her. And then you disappeared. You finally got back that piece and lost it within days. So, I swear to you that I will live life to the fullest from now on. Live it, live it enough for the both of us. I will live on as though this week this day never happened. But I will never forget the short time we shared together for as long as I live. I didn't know what expressions Satoshi made as he listened. But as someone who protected the same girl, I felt he had smiled and, give, and given me his blessing. And then, my hand moved of its own accord and the bat I had hesitated to throw away left my hands and flew through the air. It traveled its parabolic path, spinning all the while, and the swamp absorbed it without a sound. There weren't even any ripples when it hit the surface. That surface was... Temp was 
was temp uh, temptuous because of the downpour. And the bat was long gone. For a moment, I regretted having thrown it. But I realized that might have been what Satoshi had wanted. So then, uh... Right. I... Still can't let myself give in to emotion just yet. I return from my shovel, get on my bike, dig a hole to hide the body, and bury it. It seems like a simple sequence of events, but I felt extremely exhausted, and I had to do it all tonight. To tell she left me with only the, with only the advice that I needed to finish this up soon. Then fell silent for eternity, and disappeared at the bottom of the demon's abyss. I returned to the path I had ambushed her uncle on. My bike was hidden, sleeping in the bush, brush. I stood it back up. My whole body felt heavy. But I needed to be finished by the end of the day. Even if I had to whip myself to do it. Oh. I forgot something. I didn't just come here for my bike. The shovel was here too. Not good. I was zoning out. Every once in a while, if I let my guard down, my vision would almost go black. Pull yourself together, Keiji Mebara. It's still not over. I went into the grove of trees and looked for the hole in which I'd hidden the shovel. Unfortunately, I had hidden it deep in the forest, not wanting it to be seen. And now everything was black in the night. And I couldn't see anything anymore. You really should have brought a flashlight of some kind. I reawakened my fading consciousness. And realized just how big this annoyance really was. Oi! Majikayo! Wait. You can't be serious. The sweat the rain washed away before came back up to my skin. Deep, deep within in the forest, where the street lights could never reach. The fact that it would be so pitch black had been completely uncalculated. With this much darkness, even if I had been able to kill him right away like I'd planned, I didn't know if I could still have, bur have buried him without a problem. What should I do? I simply couldn't find the shovel. I find the shovel tonight. If I forced myself to go deep into the forest, I'd lose even my sense of direction and might actually get lost in there. That might have been an exaggeration, but it was fully possible I'd trip over a tree root and sprain a muscle. All right, my house's storage room. There was another shovel there, the same fold-up kind. Couldn't I go back to the house, get the shovel, and give up on finding the shovel tonight? It's not as though the name Maibara is written on the shovel, but it seems like an unusual item for an import variety store made in another country, so... I didn't want to leave that shovel here. But... In this darkness, I couldn't do anything. I should give up and go back to the storage room. And... There was an electrical lantern in there. If I used that for light, I could look for it. But... It was so extremely dark. Could I light the way with just the lantern? 
the light of a lantern in this dark night. I couldn't discard the possibility of it drawing eyes. And I doubted if I could find the shovel of the lantern's feeble light. Besides, I'd left the body there for a pretty long time already. My sense of fear, dulled through excessive exhaustion, finally reared its ugly head. Anyway, for now. For now, the most important thing was to hide the body. A shovel being found wouldn't be a big deal. But a corpse? If they found that, I'd share the same fate as Satoshi. First, I'd go back to his storage room at home. Then I'd get the lantern. Now that's gone in the stark, I might still need a light to dig a hole for the body, too. And I'd get the other shovel. And then I'd deal with the body first thing. Once that was done, I'd come back here, find the shovel, and bring it back. I had to. I had to do at least that much. But I was so tired. But complaining was getting me nowhere. If I started getting complacent now, everything will have been for naught. At some point, I had sat down. I gritted my teeth and endured, lifting my heavy hips. The night was young. Of all the nights I'd experienced, none had ever been this long. When would it all end? The night was young. The lights at home were dazzling and bright. Suddenly, they reminded me of how hungry I was. I checked the clock and saw that it was almost seven. I thought for sure it was two or three in the morning already. I was surprised at how messed up my biological clock had gotten just from this one night. It was a warm light coming from the curtains in the living room window. The worlds between here and what was beyond the, those curtains were so different. If that man hadn't shown up, I would have been in that light. I'd still be excited from the festival, and I'd be talking to my parents about how much fun I had with all my friends. And then, even though they made a hot meal for me, I would have eaten way too much at the stalls, barely eaten any of it, and gone back to my room. No doubt I'd crawl into my futon and easily let myself fall asleep. But right now, I was completely different. There wasn't a single ember of warmth from those dark, from those weak street lights. Right now, I was unconnected to any time spent with my family, and there was neither warm food, nor the time to allow myself to sleep. My body exposed to the cold rain. I knew that I simply had to spur myself on to accomplish what I must. I realized how timid, how cowardly I was becoming. For what reason did I need to kill someone? Even if it felt this terrible, I lost sight of I lost sight of my purpose. I selected the fastest, most fundamental way of saving Satoko, and executed it without hesitation. That man was dead. He was gone. He would never, ever hurt Satoko again. 
We all thought frantically for days on end about Satoko's problem. And finally, with no options, we gave up. And I had solved it in one night. No, you didn't. Thanks. You just made things a whole lot worse. By myself, without anyone's help. Right about now, Satoko would be making dinner for her uncle, despite not knowing when he'd return. And she might be spending the night trembling in fear of whether he'd yell at her for how it tasted. But her uncle wouldn't come home. She wouldn't have to fear his wrath, nor let him make her feel sad. I... I see. I did it. I successfully saved Satoko. All I had been thinking about for a long time was killing that man, and I'd forgotten the feeling that it was technically all to save her. Suka. I did. <laughs> I did something good. That's right. I did something good, didn't I? No. You really didn't. You were well-intentioned, but you really didn't do anything good at all. I felt hot tears coming from my eyes. That's when I first realized that the exhaustion I've been feeling was actually guilt. The blade of guilt, for a while now, had just been scraping away of its tip, hurting my heart. It hurt so bad I couldn't stand it. It was throbbing painfully. It hurt so much, it was so painful, that I cried. I cried tears of joy at saving Satoko. I didn't know why, really, anymore. I just cried. My tears fell and fell. I stood there for a while, coming to terms with those warm tears. My heart was comforted a little. All right, Keichi Mebara. That's enough. There's nothing to regret or feel ashamed about. For now. Both my, my body and mind were thoroughly exhausted. And now as a fact. It was only natural I couldn't feel anything. Even tomorrow and the day after that. I might not be able to feel anything for a while. But... There was one thing that was true. There was the undisputable fact that I had saved Satoko. One day, we would surely be rewarded. One day, I would be proud of how distressing an enterprise I had take undertaken to get Satoko's smile back. And so that I could wait for that day, I had put the finishing touches on this night. I had to put the fishing touches. If I left it undone, everything I accomplished today would be for naught. I looked back up, up at the sky, which didn't feel like it would stop raining anytime soon. Then, I rubbed my eyes and summoned forth energy from my core again. How long did I plan on spacing out? This wasn't a time for daydreaming. Someone could find that corpse this very moment. That pessimistic thought was proof the very natural emotion of fear had returned to me. As I allowed the fear to spur me onwards, I went to look for the other shovel and the lantern inside the storage room. It was fortunate. I remembered what it looked like around the street to light the body was near. With how dark it was, it was quite possible I wouldn't have been able to look it for it either. I didn't realize that when I left the place, so the idea of memorizing a spot hadn't even crossed my mind. And that's why I had to call it fortunate that I managed to get back to the body like this. 
The corpse was now located in a big, muddy pile. Half the thing had already sunk into a swamp-like pool of water. I only realized it afterward, but there was an unused irrigation channel right nearby, clogged to fallen leaves and dirt, and there was rainwater flowing in from there. My shoes had been awash with water for a long time now, so without any hesitation, I stepped into the puddle. The whole muddy stream started flowing back, luckily. I couldn't leave any slight traces, like blood stains. The rain was like a blessing from heaven. I checked around me, paying very close attention, and turned off the lantern. It became pitch black, but my eyes got used to the darkness in a few moments. And once I managed to reach the street light on the other side, I was able to make out even faint lights. I stuck the shovel into the puddle right next to the corpse. The ground was even looser here than I'd thought, and the shovel's tip easily slid inside it. I had to hurry and dig. If I took too much time, I might lose my energy and strength again. It almost felt like digging a hole in the sand at the beach. It was easy to dig, but no matter what, the muddy water kept flowing in, covering the hole. The digging wasn't going as well as I'd hoped. I dug and dug, and the water would go in, so I couldn't get a sense of how deep it was. The only way for me to measure it was to bury my own foot in the mud. I'm digging just fine. It's alright. Don't be disheartened. Dig. 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 Occasionally a car would come by on the road, and I'd hurry and hide myself in the trees. Everyone was only passing through. They wouldn't have their eyes peeled in this kind of darkness. I understood it logically, but I still couldn't help but hide. What I was really scared of wasn't quite that, that one of those cars would coincidentally happen to witness me here. It was that the distance I could spot cars from it was the distance I could spot cars from was getting gradually shorter. At first, I noticed the splashing sounds from really far away as cars drove through them. I started noticing them less and less, and with the car that just passed by, I didn't notice un un it until its headlights were upon me. I felt my senses growing duller by the second. If someone were to take a peek in secret, as I was burying the body at the worst possible time, Maybe I wouldn't even notice. The, mom the moment I thought that, I took a good look all around me. I roused my half-asleep senses and searched for signs of a presence nearby. What if I found out someone was spying on me from the trees? carnivorous feeling, snarled at me, glaring. If there was, then I would dig another hole. I'd come this far already. In order to achieve perfection, I didn't care how much more I had to pay. I didn't know what kind of face I was making at the time. But it was a def definitely a fervently glaring one. <laughs> For a second, I thought the power of your growl made the rain stop. My five senses reached the conclusion that nobody was present. 
I didn't breathe a sigh of relief. How long had I been digging this mud out of here? It was deep enough for it to go up to my knees. Maybe this was enough. Maybe I'd throw the corp in, corpse in as a test. <laughs> I swallow, getting my breathing under control. Despite how much I'd beaten him, I was afraid of touching the corpse. So instead, I dragged it by the feet to the hole. It took more than just a waggle and a tug to do it. But of course it did. Considering this man's weight, considering this man's weight was easily 80 kilograms. I rallied all my strength and dragged him. At this point, my groundless fears that he might suddenly start moving again had vanished long ago. His body fit perfectly into the muddy hole. It was more than deep enough. All right, let's bury him. Quickly, quickly, quickly. If I did a perfect job of burying it here, Everything would be over. You'd still have that first hole that you dug along getting rid of that first shovel. Because, you know, God forbid, anybody happened to walk down that path and notice and noticed both of those things, I would hide it in the hole. And none of this would have ever happened. When I realized I only had a little farther to go to finish everything, I was racked with pointless anxiety, like I was in a race against time. It was like I was absorbed in a delusion, that if I didn't bury the body quickly, it might come back to life. In any case, in a great rush, I poured mud and dirt into the hole. If I didn't work efficiently, someone might find me here. Until now, I figured if someone saw, I'd just kill them. But not anymore. I was arrested with such absolute fear that if someone saw me, it would all be over. As I finished the work off, it was a total mess. Splish, splash, squish, squash. I drew the surface of the shovel across the ground, trying to make it flat. I was completely covered in mud at that point. The rain washed the mud off my body, but not off my now blackened clothing. My body and mind were caked with panic, with fear, with rain and sweat and mud. <laughs> my shoulders heaving, I threw down the shovel and sat down in the mud. I was so exhausted that I wanted to lie down right here and sleep. It was over. This time, for real, it was over. This man was now in the bottom of the, of the wet dirt. Right this moment, there were traces that this place had been dug up. But the rain and flowing muddy water would completely cover it all within moments. Yes. It was over. I, I did it. I did it. I did it, you motherfucker! And then I fell over backwards, face up in the mud. Raindrops pelted my face without mercy, but I didn't care. After staying there for a while, resting my mind, I got up again. It was over. So let's go home. You already buried the whole thing. So now it's like it never happened. It never happened. 
So there's no reason for me to stay out here and get rained on. I wobbled to my feet. I wouldn't use the shovel anymore. I considered disassembling it, but I didn't have the strength in my absolute exhaustion. I didn't really need to take it apart anyway. Dragging the shell behind me, I head towards the light. I stood up on my, I st I stood up my bike. It had been laying in the grass by the road. I didn't know how long how I was going to get the still assembled shovel into the front basket. I put the shovel but down the back of my shirt like I'd done with the baseball bat. Unlike the bat, the corner of it was on my back, making it very painful. Plus, if I relaxed my posture even a little, it would fall out behind me. I ended up having to carry the shovel on my left hand and ride my bike using only my right hand. Not only was I in a state of total exhaustion, this was a downpour. One hand on the handlebars. I was swaying to and fro like a drunk. But I didn't care. Even swaying like this, I got a little closer to home every time I pedaled. I saw two lights swaying slowly in front of me. The car was approaching. Oh no. I need to get out of the way. From far away in the shadows of the darkness, a car appeared. Its dazzling lights washed over me. The driver made a short hunk to inf of the horn to inform me I was in the middle of the road. I have to get out of the way. I kept telling myself that. But not only was I riding one-handed, I was exhausted, so I couldn't do anything. Wobble wobble. Wobble wobble. I mean, I meandered about, not going to the right or the left. The driver decided to swerve out of the way right in front of me, and without lowering its speed much, steadily came towards me. Its outline grew larger in my vision, and telling myself again that I really needed to get out of the way, I jerked the handlebars in one direction, then lost my balance and fell over, bike and all. Well, you tried. At least you're out of the way now. My whole body splayed out, and one foot caught, got caught in the bike. This was seriously bad. My drowsiness quickly vanished, just as the cold sweat broke out on my skin. The driver recklessly spun the wheel to the left, made a counterclockwise U-turn. It came right up to me and stopped. The driver's seat, uh, seat door opened, and the driver came out. You idiot! What are you doing here? I was pretty sure someone would yell at me like that. Oh, oh, I'm not talking to? Well, what are you doing here? Look who it is. It was a woman's voice. And one I knew. I lifted my face off the ground. And looked at her. Takano-san. Takano-san. Good evening. The moon is very pretty tonight. Could you even see the moon in this downpour? My barakun. My barakun. It was raining far too hard to see the moon. Takano-san unfolded an umbrella and smiled as she spoke. That smile was for some reason uncanny. Like she'd, like she'd seen right through me. Out of all the people I could have met, 
I got the sudden feeling that this was the one I wanted to see the least. I don't know. I can't see. I don't really see any reason why we should be wary, wary of her in this situation right now. In fact, in fact, I was expecting it to be Coach, who was in the driver's seat, or maybe even Uushi. What are you do? What are you doing now so late? Practicing martial arts with a shovel. And you're soaked and covered in mud, and no umbrella either. What is that? A shovel. She had come here via car. She wouldn't have known what I was just doing. And yet, she smiled. As though she knew everything. Calm down, Keishi Mebara. She always makes that mysterious looking smile, remember? Don't, don't let her on to anything, lest you dig your own grave. So, um, it is now for sure the day of the festival. So, I got a question for you Are you dead? <laughs> The rumors say you were playing baseball with a golf club. Is that what the shovel's for, too? No, the shovel is for hockey! <laughs> You're using it as an umbrella. Real men don't need umbrellas. They only need pure, unbridled rage to keep warm and keep warm and dry. I should, t I should tell a good lie here. If I could just do that, things would work out. When I went with Reina to go digging for treasure at the dam, you forgot this was there. <laughs> hmm. And you went to get it in this downpour. When I left my house, I didn't think it would rain, so... Oh, it's been raining for a while, though. You've been out for quite some time, haven't you? She's on to us! We gotta silence her! Well, yes. I was kind of wandering around. Even so. You came from that direction, didn't you? The dam is in the opposite direction, you know. <laughs> Fuck! We definitely got we definitely gotta silence her now. Takano san was clearly aware that something exceedingly abnormal was happening with me. And as she played her little word games, she was enjoying driving me into a corner. Maybe she had a vague guess, just from the situation, of what I'd been doing. If that's the case, then I gotta, then I gotta wonder why she's so calm about, uh, about all of this. My timing really sucked. To run to her of all people, of all the times. At the very end, I could only be frustrated at my terrible luck. I'd done so much, and the end was literally right around the corner. So why? Why at the very, very end, did I run to her of all people? You do, Keishi Mebara. You're still holding something that could be a dangerous weapon. Will you silence Takano san? <laughs> Even if it would be simple to kill Takano san, dealing with the car she'd come in afterward would be an issue. I couldn't drive a car, it was completely different from a motorbike. But 
Even if the car was here, as long as there was no proof I killed her. Yes. In tonight's downpour, without any prior planning, all by coincidence, I hit and run. As long as I didn't drop any handkerchiefs with my initials on them, they would never know I killed her. A black flame quietly smoldered and raged in the core of my body. That's a scary look. <laughs> Did I tease you too much? <laughs> yes, and I think if you know what's good for you, you might want to stop. Takano-san started to laugh by herself and thankfully stopped talking about it. But the dark clouds in my mind didn't go away. Leaving that aside... How long are you planning on crawling on the ground with your bike like that? Would you mind moving out of the way? If I moved, she would weave. So I tried to get the bicycle up and out of the way, but then twisted my ankle in it and fell over. Oh, shit! There was a sharp pain in the ankle I twisted. This is nonsense. A sprained ankle? Now? Oh my. Are you alright? Did you twist your ankle? Takano san squats down and takes a good look at the ankle I keep rubbing. She compares it to my facial expression, apparently trying to gauge how bad a wound the wound was. Can you stand? I didn't expect to, but I couldn't even stand up. It was all I could do to shamelessly wriggle on the ground like a caterpillar. Takano-san looked at her watch, then at her car. And after thinking for a moment, opened the passenger seat door. Got some place to be, Takano? And then gave me her shoulder to stand up with. I'll take you home. I do feel bad, since it's almost like I hit you. I, I'm sorry. I wouldn't just leave you there. <laughs> it's a good thing I'm a nice person. <laughs> yeah, you see, that's the thing, though. People who, people who tend to call themselves nice people, more often than not, aren't really nice people. You, if you're a nice person, you just do nice things. But then again, there's also people like me who will sometimes call, my, uh, who I, where I will sometimes call myself a nice person when I'm trying to be funny or self-deprecating. So I don't know. I know nothing. But what else is new? Nobody good has ever called themselves a nice person. But that would have been a terrible thing to say to someone holding me up like this. I took Takano-san's hands and sat down in the passenger seat. Takano-san went around the back and looked at my bike on the ground. I don't suppose we could take the bicycle home tomorrow. I could clearly tell from her face that she thought it would be a pain, since it would be heavy and would get her car dirty. But my bike has a name I bar written on it. I couldn't leave it out here like this. Um, well, can you somehow put it in the car? I sort of 
need it. The trunk is already full. If I put it in the back seat, it'll get the seat sturdy with mud. Well, given how you're already in here, it's already dirty, I suppose. I turn back to the back I turn to the back seat and see someone's folding bicycle there already. Is it hers? It still looked big enough to fit my bike in there as well. My expression reflected my thoughts. And the exact thoughts seemed to get through to her. Alright, alright. I'll put it in here for you. I'll be really nice, but just for tonight, okay? <laughs> Takano san continued her mean jokes, but she hoisted my bike and loaded it into the back seat for me. The mean jokes were one thing, but couldn't she do something about that eerie smile of hers? You didn't buy and even more importantly than the bike. I didn't want to leave the shovel here. The shovel could be directly connected to the buried body and to me. Um, sorry to ask another favor, but could you get my shovel too? Takano-sen gave me a clearly dubious expression. Your shovel? That's fine with me. Is it important? <laughs> the more I talk, the worse it gets for me. You could just simply say that my father that my father needs it for a project that he's got going on tomorrow. That's how it felt, so I didn't force myself to answer her. Eventually, outlasted by my silence, Takano san gave a short shrug and sighed. Alright, I understand. You need your shovel, right? You don't need to make it you don't need to make such a mean face. Takano san brought over the shovel that was lying in the middle of the road. I clutched it like I'd never let go of it again. Takano san watched me with a puzzled look. Okay, let's be off. Maibara kun, you live at the Maibara mansion, don't you? Why does everyone call my house the Maibara mansion? Because it's actually a mansion. It must be nice to be rich. As she spoke, Takano-san pulled the handbrake and stepped on the gas. After making a skillful U-turn using the shoulder of, of, of the road, she steadily increased in speed. From the rearview mi mirror, that cursed place seemed to melt into the darkness. I tried? Huh? Ah, sorry, I didn't quite hear you. Hmm. I... Something about the fold-up bike in her backseat's just bothering me. She has a car. And I'm assuming that she went into the into the uh, storehouse with Tomotaki sometime during the festival. So, and yet, and yet, I know for a fact that, uh, and yet, I, and yet, when uh, we met Tomotaki in this chapter, he had a bike. I I, I can't think of why Takano would have a bike right now, since she has her car right here. 
Huh? I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear you. What was that? Takano-san suddenly tried to say something to me, but thoughtlessly I didn't catch it. Looking ahead, Takano-san said the same thing one more time. Stay. The body. Huh? Uh. Huh? How well was it buried? What the fuck? <laughs> I thought my heart might beat out of my chest, but I didn't let it show. But my lungs were squeezed tight, and I couldn't breathe. What? What are you talking about? When burying bodies in mountains like these. You have to bury it fairly deep because wild dogs will often smell the corpse and dig it out. Some human bone a wild dog brings back in its mouth leads to an incident being uncovered. The police head out to a stretch of mountains. It actually happens pretty often, you know. <laughs> she fucking knows what we did. She... Were you... Were you... Present in the area at that point? Or were we just able to guess what he was up to? Just looking at the state he was in. Along with what he had, I had on him. Shovel and all. More importantly, since you seem to have a pretty good idea of what I was up to, what exactly are your intentions? What are you going to do about it? Pound, pound. Clang, clang. Huge rusted bell started ringing in my head. Had I buried it so deep that I could ab say it absolutely wouldn't be found? answer was no. I was in such a rush to bury him and get it over with that I couldn't deny the possi having possibly buried it too close to the surface. No, wait, 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 wait. That's not... Wait, anyway. This woman. How? How does she know? She just passed by here in her car by coincidence. And we ran into each other. By coincidence. If she had been watching the entire thing from the trees, and once I left, she came back in her car, it didn't make logical sense. Was that the f Well, that might explain that feeling of being watched you, ha you seem to have earlier. So then, why? Kaji Mebara, that's it. You need to kill her. My entire body reawakened. I could feel my pupils dilate. I couldn't possibly beat her to death with a shovel in such a small car. Then, I would use my hands and strangle her. You fucking idiot! You're just ass- Don't even think about trying that! You are in a moving fucking car! And she is the driver! You try anything on her now, you're just asking to become the next Darwin Award winner. But, she was driving right now. If, we, if I strangled her, we might get into an accident. Thank you for thinking about that. Holy shit, don't scare me like that. Then, suddenly, Takano-san turned and looked at me. What? No witty retort. For a moment I was surprised. What was she talking about? It would seem we're not a very good match. Takano san said, disappointed, returning her gaze ahead.
I realized the words she said a few times in my head and finally realized she meant it as an off-color joke. You sure? You sure it was a joke? I didn't know whether it was really a joke, but... I wouldn't be able to fool her, no matter how many lies I told. Right now, for driving a ca the car like this, I couldn't kill her. I'd have an even harder time doing it when we got back to my house. The moment we met, that had been my best chance. And to have missed it so easily, it hurt. After that, Takano-san didn't say a single word. The car was completely buried in an almost suffocating silence. What kind of woman had I run into? I'm honestly really starting to question that myself. Just what kind of woman are you, Takano? If, assuming you really weren't joking, then... Why are you helping me out, so to speak? Does it mean that you're not just going to take me somewhere and kill me yourself or something? Because reason, Because, I don't know, because reasons. And then, the, and then it just kind of, and then I still, and there's still something about the folding bike here that's, that's bothering me. Like, I know at one point you had to have been with Tomataki-san, so is that actually his bike? I, I have no fucking idea if that actually is his bike or not. I'm just, I'm just making wild fucking guesses here, because she has a car. She's, she clearly has no issue driving it. She had to have been somewhere, I assume, around near where the festival was. So, why does she have a bike in the back seat of her car? Then again, maybe she just goes, maybe she just goes freaking biking sometimes. I guess that's not... Okay. Maybe I'm, maybe, maybe I'm overthinking this. Maybe I'm overthinking this. But at the very least, I know one thing for sure now at this point. You're creepy, Takano. You are seriously creepy. And given the kind and given everything I've dealt with in this in this series up until this point, a very creepy person like you is someone who I should probably be very suspicious of by default. With everything that happened today, I managed to pull it off. And at the very end of it all, I just had to go home and go back to sleep. Bad luck. As my sleepiness gradually overtook me, the anxiety I felt steadily started to matter less and less. It's all right, Keiji Mebara. You probably should not leave this woman alive. Right now, I'm tired. She stepped on the brakes, and I jerked against my seatbelt. That woke me up. I thought I must have fallen asleep by accident. I looked out the window, and there was a big building with faint lights on. It was really dark out, but I knew immediately it was my house. I'll go get your folks for you. Would you mind the place for a few moments while I'm gone? <laughs> Why must, you, why must you laugh at everything? Don't make fun of me, please. Besides, look. I'm fine now. I can walk by myself. Oh my. You were in such pain before that you had to get me to carry you. 
お姉さんに甘えてみたかったから Did you just want a pretty lady to be nice to you? <laughs> As Takano san spoke, she left the car and opened up her umbrella. The sound of falling raindrops was fierce, as always. I carefully reached down and rubbed the ankle I twisted. There was still some pain and a little weirdness, but they weren't that bad anymore. Rather than being happy about how light, light the wound was, I first regretted this whole thing. If I hadn't twisted my ankle, I could have still taken the option of killing Takano san right then and there. There probably wasn't much doubt that Takano san was convinced I was involved in some sort of crime. If she knew about everything happening with Satoko, then she might have even guessed I'd killed somebody. c clink. Well, thinking about it, you were you did ask an awful lot of questions to her, to her about the nature of the curse and well how you, and how a lot of your questions seem to strongly imply you wanted it to happen to a very specific person. That alone would be cause for suspicion. Takano san opened the, pa the, the passenger side door for me. You sure you don't need my shoulders? I wouldn't mind doing it for you again. <laughs> I ignored her and answered by getting out of the car by myself. The rain was still pretty intense. I got my bicycle out of the back seat. I was a bit curious who the other bike belonged to, but that didn't matter right now. So you're curious too. I'm glad it's not just me then. In fact, I think the fact that you brought attention to this little thing here kind of, isn't, kind, kind of makes me think that maybe I am right to be a little concerned about the identity, the owner of the bike, but I, I, I don't know, but I can admit, like I just pointed out earlier, maybe it's hers, maybe she just goes biking. I let Takano San hold the umbrella over me, and then push my bicycle up to the front door. Just want to make sure, I, just want, I'm just trying to make sure I don't jump at every single little suspicious thing I see and run away with it in case I'm wrong. Thank you very much. I'll be fine now. My ankle hurt so much earlier, and it still did, but it aggravated me that it hadn't been, even been that bad. It was really seriously terrible luck. Alright. I'll be leaving then. Keep it a secret. Keep it a secret. That we had a nice evening drive together by ourselves, okay? Why do you want that to be a secret? What would be the problem with people knowing? <laughs> Especially from Jiro san. Jiro san? Oh. Huh. She meant Tomotaki san. That, that, you know, that's, now that you bring him up, I do wonder. Is he having a really bad time right now? Probably being assaulted by multiple assailants and clawing out his own neck. I suppose she calls him by his first name. His full name must be Jiro Tomotaki then. And then. The other bike, the one fo the, the folding one in the back seat that I didn't care about at first, suddenly came to mind. Hey, excuse me from him as out, right? On the day before yesterday, as I walked near the dam, half asleep, Tomotaki san had talked to me. And the bicycle had been riding, it was. <laughs> That bicycle in the back belongs to Tomotaki-san, doesn't it? 
Takano San's eyes. I think they sharpened for a moment. Interesting reaction. And why do you think that? I saw him. I, I saw it when I met him before. The frame stood out to me. <laughs> why are you being vague about this? But wouldn't that be odd? Do you think it's possible for this to be Jiro san's bike? Well, if the if the frame matches exactly what he had before, that wouldn't be an unreasonable assumption to make. Odd. Huh? Takano san. Her hair elegantly fluttering, peers into my eyes. Well, there are no bed and breakfasts in Hinamizawa, are there? Jiro-san would need to be staying in town. Is that so? So you're saying that you let him stay at your place then? Well, I guess that's right, huh? You can't really walk from town to Hinamizawa, can you? And there are no buses either. You at least need a bicycle. She didn't need to tell me that. That's why Jiro san was riding a bike. For Jiro san's bicycle to be stowed in my car. And, and him not in there. That'd be strange, wouldn't it? Jiro san wa Hinamizawa de jiten sha nashi te koto ni natcha wa yo. It would mean Jiro san was in Hinamizawa. Without a bike. Yeah, well, the yeah, you see, the thing is, though, I would be inclined to agree with you if it weren't for chapters two, t chapter two's events. Because for all I know, you and him were in, were in fact here in Hinamizawa together during the festival, breaking into that storehouse. Only we weren't present there to witness it this time around. And then you all just go some go somewhere after the fact so yeah it's not that strange to me honestly I'd have left Jiro san somewhere and put his bike in the car wouldn't I it wouldn't make sense. In both the previous chapters, he dies, and his body is found basically in the middle of in the middle of town by by the streets. And the autopsy reports always mentioned how it looked like, how it seemed like as though he was attacked by multiple assailants, seemingly going by wounds on his body, and he would wander through through town for a little bit, probably believing that he was being chased or something. And then, eventually, he'd start to claw out his own neck, and his body would end up being found in the next morning. The reason I'm bringing this up here is because I'm just, I'm, I'm just thinking. I'm, I'm, I'm scrutinizing what she's saying here, and going by what I remember of previous events relating to Tomotaki-san, because right now, she's acting suspicious to me. Ever since she showed up and started joking about the body, about me bearing a body, her whole, every, everything about her is not... Hmm. 
Well, either way, bottom line is thinking of things over. I think it's definitely possible that you probably left him somewhere. Or maybe you, or at the very least, maybe you two just went your own separate ways for some reason. But, if that was the case, it really begs the question then. If you two let, just simply went your separate ways, why didn't he take his bike with him? It would be kind of a pain to get around Hinamazawa without the bike, as you yourself just pointed out, so... You probably just left him somewhere, didn't you? As you spoke, Takano-sen made eyes, made eyes like a hawk. And you're just, whole, your whole demeanor right now even, as you're offering me these explanations, especially with the hawk-like eyes here, it's just, I'm not the only one who thinks this is, all this is suspicious when taken all, when taken together, right? It's not just me, I'm not just reading too much into this. Unfortunately, I didn't really understand what was so odd. What about that is odd? Are you and Tomotaki-san friends? I don't really think it would be strange for there to be some reason you had his bicycle in your car. But it would be. What I mean is, Jiro-san and his bicycle being in different places in Hinamazawa wouldn't make sense. And for those reasons, it means this bicycle can't be his. Unless you just simply dropped him off somewhere and didn't give him his bike. Then that would make sense. Do you understand now? But if you did that, then the question I got asked next is, why would you do that? Takano-san's roundabout way of talking was hard to comprehend. But that eeriness I could feel, that vague dreadfulness, I didn't like it at all. But... The most wild instinctive part of me warned me not to cry. That's my bicycle. Why didn't you just say that right from the very fucking beginning then? Why go through this entire roundabout, quite this roundabout little way of this conversation here and all this stuff? You're, you're just making yourself even more suspicious here. Jiro-san picked it out for me, though, so I can't deny that it looks alike. He picked out the same exact bike that he has for you? Ah, so that was that. I see now. I thought it looked similar. You and I never saw each other tonight. And now she was talking about something completely different. What are you talking about? You and I never saw each other tonight. I stayed there not knowing what to say. And Takano-san repeated her eerie, succinct phrase to me again. You and, I, you and I never met this night. You and I never saw each other tonight. Something cold and unpleasant crawled up my spine. I knew, because I killed a person with my own hands before. Before, I came to the conclusion that I had only one chance to beat this woman to death to keep her quiet, and I couldn't hesitate. So I could tell. 
that she had arrived at the same very same conclusion. Then that would mean that she killed somebody then. If that's true, isn't it? My instincts warned me again. I wish I never met this woman. The faint scents, like a rotten smell, drifting from this woman, was no doubt the exact same scents that I was get that I was giving off right now. Did you have something to do with what happens with Tomotaki-san? Even in, at least indirectly? The very particular, the very peculiar asp aspiration. The lack of uncertainty of taking a human's life for a purpose. One that only those who have risen above everything had. Actually, maybe I should have called it a nausea. A nausea. It meant, and I didn't know how to explain this very well, but Takano-sen was the same as me. In other words, someone who shouldn't have been here. Someone I couldn't have let anybody know was here. Someone who nobody would have wanted to see. And now that we had, we could calmly pretend as though we never met. Yes, which meant that, just like I wanted to have nothing else to do with her, she didn't want anything to do with me either. And she too wanted to make it so we'd never met. Both of us wished for the same thing. Our desires were the same, which meant Takano-san's suggestion was extremely practical and that I couldn't outright refuse. If that's fine with you, then sure, whatever. You and I didn't meet this night. You're right. That'd be best for you too, wouldn't it? Why do you think that? Are you seriously asking me that? You, you can't figure that out on your own, boy. She cut me off with a condescending word, boy. Right in front of my house. In a place most unsuited to killing. And yet, there was a frozen thirst for blood coming from both of us. I would be killed right here, right now. Yeah. And I should have definitely beaten her as we passed each other. A damp, greasy sweat broke out on my body. It's fine. If you want me, then you can come any time. And when I made up my mind, she shook her hair elegantly and turned on her heel. Good. I am a kind person, after all. I don't believe you. That was good. How? Because she was a kind person. Was that it? I didn't get it. Takano Sen got into her car. We didn't exchange any words of parting. I had performed a massive feat the killing of Satako's uncle, and yet I didn't feel any accomplishment. And the holy night of Orishiro Sama's curse, in which the taking of another's life was allowed. On a terribly rainy night when the demons wandered, as agents of Orishiro-sama's will, the demons were never supposed to meet. But suddenly, they did. The demons 
hard ways triumphantly. There was no reason for them to fight. Both their objectives had already been accomplished. With the rain hitting me like a waterfall, my eyes met with Takano Sands through the car window. The female demon, her mouth twisted into a distorted, fearless smile. It was too late to kill her. Far too late. That first moment, the very first moment we saw each other, had been my best chance. And now that we had parted like this, I was acutely aware of it. I should not have let her live. She beeped her horn quickly, and her car drove away into the dull, into the deluge, the deluge. The one woman who knew who knew what really happened tonight disappeared into the dark. As long as she was alive, this night would never really end. Just get into an accident, I thought to myself. In this downpour, slip on some mud or something, fly face first into a tree, and die. That wasn't a delusion, a wild, a wild flight of fancy, fantasy. It was an earnest wish. Yes, it's a command. Die. Die! And keep your mouth shut for eternity. Because I have no doubt you're wishing for me to die all the same. My curse upon her faded emptily as Takano San's taillights disappeared into the utter darkness. <laughs> Her car's lights were completely out of sight now. Even the sound of the engine faded into the sound of the heavy rain. It was inaudible now. I too turned on my heel. To draw the curtains on this insane night. To open my front door and end it all. I began walking towards the front door. I was covered in mud and made a squishing sound of every step I took. Squish. Squish. Don't worry, Keiichi Mibara. <laughs> Squish. Squish. She'll die. <laughs> Squish. Squish. Her end will be as miserable as she is. I'll throw her into some flames alive, and let her dance until she's burned into a crisp. I'll burn her to ashes in the fires of hell itself until she's roasted as much as she deserves. So Squish. I really do. Squish. Huh? Just now, I... am taking a step. And yet... A footstep. Without a motion, I turned around. If there was a footprint that wasn't my own, then it was obvious someone else was behind me. Was somebody else there? I was sick of this. Whoever it was, I was sick of everything tonight. This time, I would kill them. I'd kill them without a second thought. I wouldn't hesitate to turn around and dig another hole. <laughs> but, fortunately, there was nobody there. I wasn't going to have to kill any more people tonight. This night, I couldn't handle any more of it. Even if I heard an extra footstep each time I stopped, I put it down to me just being tired. To 
six from unlocked, fire from hell, and victim of the fifth year. Yeah, it's official. Takano is definitely freaking suspicious. In fact, I'm now, I'm now just thinking over the last two chapters, everything I, everything I remember seeing of her back in, back in those two chapters, any behaviors that I might, that I can recall, that might, in retrospect, have seemed suspicious in hindsight. But, I can, I'm gonna do some of that thinking off camera, because I'm going to be cutting this, I'm gonna be cutting this episode off here, and we can check out these tips I just unlocked, and then continue on to the next chapter in the next episode. What a freaking night this has been. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this latest episode of Higurashi When They Cry, Chapter 3. If you did and you want to see more content from me, feel free to subscribe to my channel. I will see you all next time. Take care.